I praise you, Lord. I praise you in your sanctuary. I will praise you in your mighty heavens. I praise you for your acts of power. I praise you for your surpassing greatness. Praise God with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise God with the harp and the lyre. Praise God with tambourine and dancing. Praise God with the strings and the flute. Praise God with the clash of cymbals. Praise God with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. church. I want to welcome our brothers at Aquani campus. I want to look those tuning in online, our brothers and sisters in Bettendorf and each of you here at Rock Island. Picked a great weekend to be part of this gathering. It's actually part of a, a larger weekend of celebration and service. It kicked off Saturday with our opportunity to facilitate Day with Dads at our Kiwani campus where the men there were able to connect with their children and we we're privileged to be part of that process, as well as our Jefferson School cleanup in our Davenport relationship and our connection to the, to the school there and the students and the teachers there. It continued into Saturday night where we celebrated new life in Jesus as we witnessed 79 people step into the waters of baptism. It was a powerful, powerful time of celebration where people are now positioned to be free to live in Jesus. And we're going to celebrate that a bit more at the end of our time today with a video in case you missed it or just as a reminder if you were there. But we're also today wrapping up our Psalm series. The Psalms is one of the more familiar books of the Bible. And, and we've been hanging in the Psalms through the course of the summer. It's provided our anchoring scripture and our conversations. But the, but the name Psalms is actually a, a Greek word. And it speaks to instrumental music. It speaks to songs of, from the harp. And, and, and the reality is, it doesn't, it's not the Hebrew word for prayer and praise, which is exactly what this book of books is. The, 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 the Psalms are a collection of collections. They, they are prayers of the heart. And, and we're wrapping up a journey that has allowed us to understand how we relate to God, how we relate to others in this world as we walk in proximity to Him. And today we're going to land the conversation around understanding how this book, this, this prayer book, this book of praise that was used by God's people for many, many years as a prayer book in worship in the temple, how we can continue to allow it to speak to us and even speak for us. Now, I want to remind or even frame as a frame of reference what, again, this is as a collection of collections. It actually consists, the book of Psalm consists of five separate books. One, two, three, four, five. And each of these books contain their own separate doxologies. And doxology is another Greek word. It's made up of the Greek word doxa, uh, which means glory, and, and logia, which means sayings. And so glory sayings. So doxologies are glory sayings. They're, they're, they're small or brief hymns that are added to the end of psalms or hymns to give praise to God. And there are five distinct doxology moments in the book of Psalms. They come in the last chapter of every book, 41, 72, 89, 106, and 150. And today, as we wrap up our journey, we're going to lean into looking at the final psalm in the final book of the entire book. It's actually grouped with five other doxologies in this fifth and final book, Psalm 150. But before we do that, I want to revisit the definition of praise. See, praise in the dictionary is defined this way, to express a favorable judgment of something or to commend something, to glorify especially by the attribution of perfections. Okay, that makes sense. We understand the word praise and it fits well when we start talking about who God is. But, but the Bible, the word that the Bible use, uses to describe praise is halal. Say halal. 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 It, it, it's the word that is used to describe praise. It's used 165 times in Scripture. 117 times it's translated as praise. The rest of the time it's translated as commend or celebrate. It, it, it also even has this hint of being unguarded and reckless, almost foolish in abandon in praise. But halal is the actual word by which praise is declared. 
And in one sense, true biblical praise, and I want you to think about it this way. True biblical praise is us giving all that we know of us to all that we know of him. Giving all that we know of us to all that we know of God. That's true biblical praise. That's Hallel. And today in our time, we're going to lean back into the Psalms, which are filled with Hallel. And we're going to continue to understand that it is a platform of praise and prayer, which is incredibly helpful because the greatest form of prayer is praise. When we engage in a conversation with God, the greatest expression of prayer is the expression of praise in that conversation. And we're going to lean into that today in one more prayer of the heart. It's Psalm 150. So if you've got a Bible, I invite you to go ahead and get there. You can turn to it. You can follow here on the screen or in your note guide. But Psalm 150 is the final psalm in the final collection of psalms. It's the fifth doxology. In fact, it's grouped with five psalms. Psalm 146 to Psalm 150 are, are grouped as doxologies. And they all start with the same wording and end with the same wording. They all start with praise the Lord. They all start with that call to Hallel, to praise God and who he is. And we're going to highlight a bit of the what and the why in, in worship. But what Psalm 150 does, Psalm 150 gives us the who, what, when, where, why, and how of worship. And we're going to take a look at that today because the whole psalm gives us the where. It, it puts us in, excuse me, it gives us the when, of, of, where, of when it's supposed to take place. But as we get into each of the verses, we see the who and the what and the how and the why along in the rest of the process. So let's take a look. You can grab your Bible, you can follow along. I'll read here and you can follow here on the screen or as we go along in your own scriptures or in the note guide. Right out of the very first line is where we get the what. And you can mark this in here if you'd like to. Praise the Lord. That's the what. This whole psalm declares the when, but the what is in the very first line. Praise the Lord. Then right after the what declares the where. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. So Psalm 150 highlights two places appropriate to praise God. In his sanctuary, which was for hundreds of years, many years, he revealed himself to his people in the tabernacle, in the temple, but also in the heavens, which is this infinite space that is actually too small to contain him. There is a what, and then there is the where. Out of that, we see a why. Why follows right behind, and it's in verse 2. And it's a critical component to understanding praise. Verse 2, praise him for his acts of power, praise him for his surpassing greatness. There's the why behind the what. Who he is and what he does. Now we're going to come back to this in a bit. We're going to settle into this concept, but I want to lean into the next few verses because verses 3 to 5 address the how with a list of instruments. And depending on the translation you're using, these instruments could start to sound like instruments you may find being played by Who's and Whoville. <laughs> They're a little bit odd, but let's take a look at this. Verse 3, praise him with the sounding of the trumpet, praise him with the harp and the lyre. Now the lyre is also known as a lute. It's believed to be a hollow stringed instrument, kind of like a guitar. Verse 4, praise him with the trimble. That's like a tambourine. It's similar to a tambourine known as a trimble. And then there's dancing. It says praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. So let's just hold right there because there are eight different instruments that the psalmist describes and then inserts dancing in the middle of it. And it's almost as if he is actually just declaring that there is no instrument to be left out. But it's not just an academic list of making sure that he includes every musician who's, who's in the band to make sure they get credit and billing for being part of it. No, no. He's actually saying everything we have, all that we have, can be used to praise and worship our God. Every and any instrument can be used in praising his great name. But on top of that, what he's doing in this space is also declaring that the task of praise is not limited to the priests. It's not limited to the tribe of Levites who are charged with managing the temple and charged with facilitating worship. It's saying that the task is for everyone, all people. This is where it gets us now into the, the who of this psalm. Verse 6, let everything, say everything, that has breath, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, this is an incredibly fitting way to end the book of Psalms. Not only with a who, what, when, where, and why, and how, but with a declaration. Let everything that has breath, every living thing, praise the Lord. 
That's great. It's fantastic. But catch what's, what's required. What's the necessity in this expression? It's breath. All of us using the breath God has given us to return praise back to him. The one who gives breath, the one who gives life, being praised by the breath of those he's given it to. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Now, Psalm 150 is not only the the closing psalm of the fifth book and the fifth of those final five doxologies, it is the end of the entire book of Psalms. And it's, it's pretty different than a few of the other psalms we looked at, especially the last two. Psalm 91 and Psalm 121. In in that space, with those psalms, the the psalmist tackled pain and trouble and problems. But in contrast, in Psalm 150, Psalm 150 doesn't tackle much of anything. There's no crisis. There's no issue. It's it's just simply praise. It's simply a call to praise the creator of all creation, to, to give him the praise that he is ultimately due. See, when we think about praise, and you don't need to draw this right now. You can catch up here in a little bit and draw it later. But when we're talking about praise, Hallel, we're we're talking about connecting to who God is. And and the who, what, when, where, why, and how of of worship and praise is important. But what's really connected to who God is and what he does. And he is, he's omni-three. He's omniscient, he's omnipotent, he is omnipresent. So he's all-knowing, he's all-powerful, he's present everywhere all the time. We looked at that last week. And as a result, he, he can, he sees, and, and, and he, he knows he sees and he can. And you can check out last week online at heritagequeasy.com if you're interested to find out more about how he knows and sees and can. But because he knows and sees and can, he actually is moving and working in past, present, and future. And because he's working in past, present, and future, we're actually positioned to give him praise for what he's done. Things already passed. Things in spaces and places where he's already moved. We're also positioned to praise him for what he's doing. Actively, right now, present reality. And we're positioned to praise him for what he will do. What he's done, what he's doing, and what he will do. This is because of who he is. Now, I wonder when we lean into praise, and this is for me as well, what is driving me when I praise? Is it what he's done? Is it what he's doing? Or what he will do? See, in the Psalms, and specifically these last five Psalms, there is a repeated call to praise the Lord. It literally says, praise ye the Lord. Say that with me. Praise ye the Lord. Okay, that comes from the word Hallel Yah. Hallel Yah literally means praise ye the Lord. Now, if you grew up in the church, you may be thinking about a little ditty that we used to sing in church or in Sunday school. It would go like this, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And the response was? Very good. Okay, good. All right, those of you who knew that, well done. Now it's going to be stuck in your head as well. If you didn't grow up in church, you're not familiar with that, that's okay. Sorry for the awkward moment, the goofy song. But what it does is it points back to this call to praise you the Lord. And in in Psalm 150, the very first line, the what of the whole psalm is Hallel Yah. This is where we get hallelujah as a word. But there's a shift that takes place because this line occurs first and last in Psalm 146, 147, 148, 149, and 150. Hallel Yah. But in Psalm 150, there's a shift right here to Hallel El. Hallel El, which is praise the strong God. Praise the strong God. It speaks to his power, his might, his goodness. He is powerful. He is able. He is great. And we can give him praise. Halal El. He is a strong God. He is omnipotent, all-powerful. He is more than able. And as we already saw, the why in this psalm is verse 2 of his powerful acts and surpassing greatness. He can. He is more than able, although we don't always understand how or or when or why he chooses to move. The reality is that God does what he does because he is who he is. Our God does what he does because he is who he is. From creation to redemption to his return as King of kings and Lord of lords. 
He does what he does because he is who he is. And because God was and is and is to come, he's never changing. He's never changing. We don't always know or understand what he does. But within his identity, within his character, within his nature, we, we find certainties. We find certainty amidst uncertainty. We find things that, that don't change amidst circumstances. God does what he does because he is who he is. And who he is provides us certainty even in the middle of uncertainty based in who he is. And what he does out of who he is is always consistent with his character. Always. Think about it this way. Because God is good, everything he does is good. Because he is love, everything he does is loving. He only does that which is consistent with his character. He never functions outside his character, which is why, which is why he will never make a rock too big for something he can pick up. <laughs> that would be outside of his character, inconsistent with his character. He does what he does because he is who he is. And Psalm 150 says, because of who he is and because of what he does, we can and ought to give him praise. In reality, who God is and what he does warrants praise. Who, who he is and what he does warrants praise. It actually pulls it out of us. He doesn't have to prove he deserves it. He doesn't have to earn it. Because of who he is and what he does, he warrants praise. He, he should be given praise. Because it's not just what he does, it's ultimately rooted in who he is. Now consider this. The Psalms would be empty. The, the Psalms would be even pointless and hollow if God was not praiseworthy and commendable. But he is. Who he is and what he does warrants praise. Look, when it comes to actually engaging in praise, we can praise him out of what he's done, what he's doing and will do. But it's not just what he does or doesn't do. It actually is more rooted in who he is. Who he is as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But hang with me for a second. God is most honored in us. God is most glorified in us, most, most praised, most pleased. God is most honored in us when we are most fulfilled in him. God is most honored in us when we are most fulfilled in him. Because it's not just about what he does. It's ultimately about who he is. Look, you and I were created for relationship with God, for fellowship with God. He wants to be in proximity to us. He wants us to experience all that he is. But sin gets in the way. Our junk, our mistakes, our rebellion, all that gets in the way. And God is a holy God and he can't hang in those unholy places and spaces. But he loves us enough, he's powerful enough. Because of who he is, he has made a way for us to get past those things. And that way is Jesus Christ. There is no other way. The only way that we sit in proximity to God and experience all that he is and see him at work in what he's done, doing, and will do is through Jesus Christ. But in order to receive that kind of connection, we have to give Jesus authority. We have to let him be in charge of our lives. And if you have not done that in your journey, you, you, you may be thinking about it. If you're wondering if you should, on the back of the note guide, you can find some next steps to it. But regardless of where you are in your spiritual journey today, whether, whether you're confident or uncertain in your spiritual journey, whether you're clear or unresolved, God is most honored in us when we are most fulfilled in him. That's the dynamic of how it works. That's the God that we serve. Now, with that in mind, I want to take a moment to invite you into an opportunity that we're, I'm just really excited about. See, we're actually, as a church, going to create space for a six-week journey in a thing that we're calling Explore Relationship. As a church, it is our heart to, out of our relationship with God, to connect others into relationship with him. And, and out of that relationship they establish, to, for them to experience wholeness and healing and freedom. 
and then the relationships around them to experience the same thing and the communities they live in to experience the same thing. But in order for that to take place, we realize as a church that we need to create space to get better at four things. Four things, an opportunity to hone these four things that allow us to live into that more fully. Those four things are simply this, to be able to know and tell the story of God. To know and tell the story of God, his pursuit of us, relationship with us. The second is to be able to tell our story in proximity and relationship to God. To tell our own story. The third thing would be to be able to, to study and know and understand scripture on our own. And the fourth is to be able to pray confidently and specifically to pray out loud. I'm convinced that if we as a church would be able to lean more fully in, in refining our skills and ability to do those four things, it'll be catalytic, transformational, and the ripple will not only be into our own individual lives, but into our, our, our cities, into our church, and beyond in the region. So, as a result, we're creating space and inviting our entire church family, all of you who, who are walking in relationship to God through Jesus, to, to join us over a six-week period, 90 minutes a week. There are three options each week for you to figure out what best fits into your schedule. But starting September 16th, the night of September 16th at 6 o'clock, then also Tuesday night, the 18th of September, followed by Wednesday morning, the 19th of September, of September are the three opportunities each week over a six-week period that we want to invite you, your, your spouse, to lean into a space with us to work on refining this critical foundation of being able to know and tell the story of God, to tell our story, to read scripture and understand on our own and to pray and to pray out loud. Whether you've walked with Jesus for 20 years or whether you're just now starting that process, this is for you and this is for us as a church family. There's gonna be more information coming out, so stay tuned in it. But in, in many ways, this is an opportunity for us to actually refine our ability to live a life in light of who he is, to be better able to live a life of praise which, to be clear, is not just simply repeating, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. It involves thinking about him. It involves talking about him and telling his story. It involves prayer. It involves chasing him in scripture. It involves sacrificial giving and serving. And, and those are the ways that we worship. You may know this, that it was actually David who first introduced music into the tabernacle temple worship. He actually grabbed a bunch of priests and he said, look, you're going to praise and exalt God. You're going to halal God in this space right here. And then he grabbed some leaders and said, here's your instrument. Here's what you're going to do. It's almost like a, a really bad way to start a band. <laughs> but he grabbed them and out of their hearts, out of their expressions, they, they began to lean into that worship expression themselves. And it's also the space that he first assigned Asaph and his sons to, to praise the Lord. And those guys would go on to write 12 of the Psalms that we know out of the book of Psalms. Now, it's probably no surprise that, that music was an instrumental part of Old Testament and New Testament worship. It's true today for us, lots of different expressions. But what David did in this particular space is he kind of prescribed how it should go. And here's what he said. This is from 1 Chronicles 16. He said, give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Tell his story. Tell what he's done in your life. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. This is how David prescribed how worship should go. And if you look closely at it, you begin to see the ability to know and tell the story of God. The ability to tell our own story in proximity to him. To, to chase him as we lean into the word and, and lean into the conversation through prayer and through praise. Don't miss the opportunity to lean into the Explore Relationship journey. I'm excited for it in many ways, but specifically for you and how God wants to work in and through you in it. But David, something to understand as he says this, David was the youngest in his family. He was an overlooked shepherd boy. His family really didn't have a whole lot of expectation or belief in him at all. Yet he would go on to, be, to live a life of victory over lions and bears and giants and armies. And it wasn't because of his greatness. It was because he was willing to look foolish. He was willing to be humble enough to hallel God, to praise him. The uniqueness and the, the, the exceptional aspects of David's life 
were a direct result of his willingness to maintain a posture of prayer. Those were possible because he made seeking God with his whole heart priority. He, made, he, he, he knew the story of God. He could tell his own story in proximity, a relationship to God. And he knew how to lean into the word and he knew how to pray. And as a result, God was able to work in and through him in lots of ways through the course of his life. So let me do this. I want to ask a question. I'm going to put this question before you. You can process it now and even later through the course of the week. It's simply this. Is your praise most driven by problem, provision, or proximity? Is your praise most driven by problem, provision, or proximity? When you praise God, when, you, when you're positioned and ready to praise God, or, or maybe a lack of praise, is it, is it because of the difficult things you're experiencing in life, the problems? Or is it driven by his divine help, the moments that you see him intervene? Or is it simply driven by who he is? I mean, they're all acceptable. They're all acceptable, but only one of them gives stability. Here's the thing. When we come over into a a context of life and we look at the things that he has done, all right, we may like it, we may not like it, we may have done what we thought he would, maybe not, but the reality is we have an opportunity to accept him for who he is and what he's done. When we look at what he's doing right now, there's a, there's a different dynamic because it's active, because it's real time. There's an element of placing trust in him in that space. And when it comes to what he will do, well, that's an element of faith. We can praise God because he's what he's done, doing, and will do. These are, these are all acceptable. But when it comes to problem, provision, and proximity as driving factors to praise, only one gives stability, and it's proximity because it's focused on him and who he is. Problems change. Problems change from day to day, different seasons of life. There's not stability in that. The the, the provision of God, although faithful, is not consistent. He always provides, but he doesn't provide the way we always think, when we think, or how we think. And that can be confusing. But we can still praise him because of who he is. It's proximity that provides stability. Because it's rooted in him, it's not just focused on us. So what's driving your praise? Is it problem? Is it provision or is it proximity? They're all acceptable. But only one provides stability. And when we know his story, when we can tell our story in proximity to him, when we know how to read scriptures on our own, we know how to pray, that facilitates proximity. That gives us the ability to abide and remain, no matter what he's done, doing, or will do, and to offer him praise in that space. Well, what's, what's driving your praise or the lack of praise? I realize for some, he didn't show up the way you thought. What he did, what's been done, doesn't feel good, and it's caused you to withhold praise. For some, you're in a space right now, it's really hard, it's really difficult, you're crying out to him, he's not answering the way you think, and you're withholding praise based on what he's doing or not doing. But my friends, he is worthy of all glory, honor, and praise because of who he is, not what he does. And until we're willing to sit in a space where we accept the reality that he is great because of who he is, we'll miss out on the fullness of sitting in proximity to him. Your circumstances are the perfect platform to experience the perfection of God, the power of the Holy Spirit working in you, and the purity of Jesus Christ. What you're in today, what you're in right now, is the perfect platform for those realities. Because true praise is rooted in who God is, we can praise Him in any time, in any circumstance. In fact, because God's greatness is unlimited, our praise can be as well. Because his greatness is unlimited, our praise can be unlimited praise. And Psalm 150, this thing that closes out the journey in Psalms, is not just an ending. It's actually an invitation. It's an invitation to praise him. The last line, praise ye the Lord. The, The Psalms started with blessed and they end with hallelujah. The invitation is to praise him for who he is, not simply what he does. And having spent some time understanding this hymnal of the Israelites, we're now positioned with a better understanding of the why and the how and the who of worship. 
but we're positioned to add our voices and our lives to the chorus of praise that rings through all of history. So what we're going to do now is we're going to step into praise, and we're going to do it in three expressions. First of which is we're going to praise him for what he's done. God is Jehovah Jireh. He is provider. He gives us what we need to live. And in doing so, he asks in return an expression of worship by giving back to him his first fruits. We call it the tithe. And what God gives, he says, the first fruits belong to me and give back. And so we're going to step into a moment of worshiping him, giving praise to him for what he's done in providing by giving back to him what belongs to him. That's first. The second is we're going to praise him for what he's doing. We're going to have the ability to watch uh, some video summary of the river baptism last night and the, and the transformation that's taking place in the lives of brothers and sisters across our network. Those 79 lives that are now positioned free to live. We're going to celebrate and praise what God is doing as we watch that. At the same time, we're going to step into a moment of, of praising him for what he will do. And we're going to do that in song. So it's giving, it's in celebration of the baptism moment, which by the way, I think we've got a half a dozen brothers at Kawhini that are getting baptized Monday night. Can't wait for that. And we're going to worship him for what he will do in song. So what I invite you to do is just like invite you to stand with me all across the network. I'm going to pray and then we're going to step into the moment to, to praise him for who he is, also in light of what he's done, doing, and will do. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I am so grateful and thankful for your willingness to work and move in our lives. You are a good, good Father. And you are worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. Who, who you are and what you've done warrants praise. So may we give it, Father. May we give you the praise that you deserve, predominantly in light of who you are. Not trying to guess and, and pick and choose over what you've been doing, but you, you deserve praise because of what you've done. But Lord, may we offer praise simply because of who you are. That you are good and that you are love. So Jesus, in these next few moments, may, may you receive our praise as we give. May you receive our praise as we celebrate life change. And may you receive our praise, our hallelujahs, as we look expectantly to you, what is still yet to come. We love you. We pray these things in, in your name. And everybody said, amen. amen.